is on-farm poultry processing right for you? That's the question we try and answer today as we take a practical look at on-farm processing. Welcome to Grass-Fed Life. I'm your host, Diego, D-I-E-G-O. Today's episode is brought to you by Grass-Fed Life, your online source for helping you create pasture-based profitability. From free resources like this podcast to courses like the brand new on-farm pastured poultry processing course, which we'll talk about more today, to the full Farm Business Essentials course, our goal is to provide you with educational content to help make your farm more enjoyable and more profitable. You can learn more about all the resources and courses offered at grassfedlife.co. Today's episode comes right alongside the debut of the brand new Pastured Poultry Processing online course. This is a course that Darby and I put together over the summer in conjunction with farmer Ben Grimes. One unique thing about Ben in his farm is he doesn't just process his own birds on farm, he actually processes birds for other farmers on his farm. That's key because that insight in his experience processing that many birds is going to give you a good feel for whether or not processing is right for you. Given Ben's experience processing a lot of poultry over the past couple of years, I think he's one of the foremost experts anywhere in the U.S. about processing poultry on farm. He does it for himself, and he does it commercially for other farmers. He knows his stuff. Today, we're going to talk about what it's like to process birds on farm, different considerations that you're going to have to think about if you want to start processing birds on farm. And at the end of it, we're asking the question, is this right for you? If it is right for you, or it's a maybe for you, then I'd strongly suggest checking out the new processing course. Given that this is a brand new course, we're looking for a group of people to beta test the course for us, to give us your thoughts on it. If you're interested in being a beta tester for the course, stay tuned to hear more about that at the end of this episode, because anybody that signs up to be a beta tester is going to be able to access the course for a special introductory price that's going to be much lower than this course will ever be sold for. You try it, you give us some feedback, and in exchange, we give you a nice discount. Learn more about that at the end of this episode. Now let's jump right into it with a practical look at on-farm processing with Darby and Ben Grimes of Dependable Poultry Processors and Dawn Breaker Farms. Yeah, I mean, that's the big thing right here, kind of at the top of the food chain, is does it pay? And for you, we talked a lot about that, Ben, that it's economic for you to charge somebody to process birds for them because you process other farmers' birds on farm, and that's part of dependable poultry processors as a standalone business. And it's also profitable or it makes sense given your context and your local situation for you to process on farm, how good are these economics for you? Like, is this a pretty attractive business to be in for you? Like, are you glad you've done this from a business sense? Yes, absolutely. I'm really glad that I kind of jumped on the opportunity last fall to open up as a third-party processor. Uh, It makes uh, excellent business sense as we can talk about and kind of get into the numbers. What's it cost you to process a bird on farm versus if you have to take it to another processor? Your one choice for a processor closed down back in 2017 compared to what you had to pay them to what it costs you now. What's the difference there? Yeah, so my costs are are higher, but there's a little bit of a... uh nuance there because a lot of my cost is actually going to be money that goes to pay me to process my birds. Um, So every time that I process birds, either for my own farm or for someone else, 
I count my time at $20 an hour. Now it's going to be $20, $20 an hour for processing, but also for anything like prep, you know, sharpening knives, setting up the facility, going out buying ice, all, all of those things I'm paying myself $20 an hour. Um, so, for example, on my last processing date, which is just, uh, you know, early September, um, for my own farm, I paid myself $405.67 for my time, you know, both before prepping as well as processing itself. Um, so my total cost per bird, uh, for all, everything, you know, that's whole birds, cut-ups, uh, this includes ice, packaging, um, is $5.16 per bird. Um, and then what is that, 80 cents of that is per bird goes directly to me. Um, so even if I was going to a processor and I was getting a cheaper price, I'd have to count in drive time. Uh, which at this point I'd be going to South Carolina. And then I would also be including, I would not be paying myself, but I'd be have to pay myself for driving there instead of incorporating that into the cost of the processing. Yeah, I, I guess just to put that into perspective, Ben, you're in the, the Raleigh-Durham area. I mean, you're like in the middle of North Carolina. So yep. to drive to South Carolina, that's days in terms of uh, uh, time and you know to, to make a trip or two down there to, to process a big batch of birds yeah it'd definitely be um you know the, the other processor up in the mountains was like four hours away um the one in south carolina feels like it's about the same here i'm going to look up on google maps it's 183 miles um and a little under four hours. So yeah, it'd also be four hours away. Okay, so, so four you're... hours with a trailer loaded down with four hundred birds. And then four hours back home. And then you know go back a couple of days later to pick them up. And, and what do you think the unit cost would be to get a bird processed down there? Uh, so actually, I I called in advance and got those numbers for us so we could compare. Um, so a whole chicken down there is three dollars and ninety cents if you bring in a hundred or more. Okay, so three ninety, and what's your cost on farm? Paying yourself? Uh, the cost on a whole bird, judging by my cost of processing for other people, is about four dollars. So you're at three ninety if you take it to somebody. You're at four bucks if you process it yourself. But the four dollars charge on the bird pays dependable poultry processors. Your business you own pays Ben you. Where if you paid the three ninety, you're giving that three ninety to another business, and you're not paying yourself to drive there, spend the time there, drive back. Yeah, I would still I would still account for my time and charge my time there, but it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a check written to myself. It'd be a check written to someone else, and then have to pay myself on top of that time. Yeah, so it's for you. It's actually cheaper uh, to 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 do it at home. I mean, even uh, if we even if we just take yeah. that th that three dollars and ninety cents plus the fuel, your yep. your it's cheaper for you to process on farm, and you're paying yourself twenty dollars an hour, and your business, I'm assuming, at the end of the day, has also got some profit sitting in there that you know was wasn't paid to you on an hourly rate, but you as the owner of that business, there's there's profit sitting there that you can yeah. You can take out of the business. You can reinvest that into the business. You, you've got choices there. That's exactly right. And why I wanted to start out with the finance side, because this is really important, because, I mean, number one, you have to look at when it comes time to processing on farm, the very first thing you have to look at is what are my options available? Meaning, what am I allowed to do in my state, in my region, and what choices do I have to outsource this? And those are going to kind of dictate where you go, regardless of maybe what you want to do. Then you can take those options and say, okay, where are the costs involved here? And I know from talking to you, Darby, you have a different picture. So you can take your chickens in to be butchered for $3 a pound. So Ben can process on farm for four. You can get yours processed for three-ish. So for you, 
I mean, even if you could process on farm, if you're charging four, do you think you lo- you could make up that dollar difference? I mean, yeah, I probably could. But for me, it's a contextual thing of <laughs> I don't want to work as hard as Ben does butchering chickens. <laughs> um, you know, um, so, yeah, for like you said, for me, it's about three dollars a bird for a whole bird. And then if we if they're all, you know, we get them cut up and, and packaged out and stuff like that, then we end up, you know, over four bucks. But just for apples to apples, it's about three dollars for Ben. It's it's call it four dollars by the time he factors in his fuel. But for me, it's only an hour and a half away. You know, it's it's just a it's a three hour trip. Now, I do have to make that twice. So it is six hours. Um but I've got other contextual things going on. Number one, when I started my business, uh, I wasn't uh, allowed in the state of Indiana to butcher on farm like that. You had to go to a state inspected facility. So I set up my business uh, to revolve around the legislation that we had here back in, in 2007. Now, it has since changed for the better, like many states. And I could, if I wanted to, I could process on farm. But I spent all my money on equipment to get the birds to the processor. And I don't necessarily want to divest myself of that. I don't want to, at this point in my farming career, invest in processing equipment. Um, I I looked at that as an opportunity to say, okay, I don't have to, you know, 10, 11 years ago, I didn't have to spend all that money on processing equipment. I, you know, contextually with land, I'm different than Ben. I've, I've got a lot more space. Um, cows make me, uh, really happy and excited. And so we took money. We would have had to invest into equipment for processing and invested in fence and cows. So like you said, a whole lot of this goes into, uh, you know, so many contextual things, you know, it's, it's, uh, there, there's not a, a silver bullet recipe here that that's going to work for everybody. It depends on your state laws like you said, it depends on the options available. What are the costs if I sub it out, do it myself? Do I want to do it myself? Would I rather take that money and invest in a different enterprise? These are all the things you gotta you gotta pour them through um, you know, that funnel, uh, like we talk about in the course, and come up with a solution that works just for you and your farm. Yeah, exactly. And going into this, before I'd even seen you loading chickens on your farm to take to your processor. My armchair quarterback, not involved, sideline bystander said, I would want to process on farm. Totally ignorant, not knowing anything that goes into it. But that that makes the most sense to me in a vacuum. Like you're raising them there. You keep them there. You exercise the most care along the way. You can maintain quality that was my thought. Then I saw you load them up and the idea of putting a bunch of stacked chicken crates on a trailer, pulling them down the highway. It's not the prettiest mental picture. And I thought, okay, for sure. Like I would want to process on farm. Then after seeing Ben's operation, that kind of turned my world on end a little bit because you run a very professional operation, Ben. I'm just not sure I would want to do that. Like, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of blood. It's a mess. It's a lot of killing. How has the act of processing on farm lined up with your context? Like, have you found that it just works for you, your personality to do this on farm, to maintain quality, to process the bird yourself? You know, why do you do it beyond the fact that you have to do it? Yeah, so actually, I talk about this a bit in the passion poultry processing course. Um, and you know, the for me, starting off, I think I was, you know, I'd read pa- passion poultry profits, and I was going to be like Joel Salatin and process on farm because you know I was just a beginning farmer, and that's what you do. Um, and then my context changed because the poultry processor, who's about an hour and a half away, shut down the spring of my first year. And so I didn't really, my other option was up in the mountains four hours away. And I really didn't want to haul chickens up the mountains four hours away. And so I said, you know, I'm going to figure out how to do this. So I really kind of over time developed a system that worked for me. I think that in my personal context, if I had a processor nearby and reliable like Darby does, 
I don't know if I would have ever gone down this route. Um, it's I enjoy the I enjoy the community that's built around it, and I like the there's part of the processing that I really like because it gives me the ability to have a system and constantly tweak that system and then test it out. You know, have that iteration and test it out and then tweak it and then test it out again. I enjoy that process, but it is a whole lot of work and a lot of management to process on farm. There's a lot of different things to keep track of, to keep track of your labor, to keep track of, um, you know, bags and propane and make sure all your equipment's operating. Um, so there's, there are a lot of different things to keep track of. And so in my personal context, because there aren't any processors nearby to me, it, it works, um, but I don't know if it's something that everybody would want to get into. Well, one thing you said there that I was really surprised at, and I it, it was obvious, but I didn't realize it going in, is how much of a management exercise it really is. While you have to jump in and you definitely play a role in the line, like you can't do that all on your own. You're not going to process 250 birds yourself in a day, so there's a lot of people involved. And other people are doing 90% of the work just because it's a distributed workload and one person can only do so much work. And there's one of you and there's eight of other people. So those eight people do the bulk of the work. And, and your job is management heavy. And I was talking to Darby the other day and I was saying, you know, I don't know that I would want to be in the trenches processing birds every time, all the time. But I like the idea of, managing an operation, managing the system, making it more efficient, getting the equipment, and then organizing the people to make it happen. Because you had a really tight staff that I was surprised after interviewing them that they were as into what they were doing as they were. And they took a lot of pride in their work. And if you could find those people, that pushes you from a a chicken neck cutter to the manager, the spreadsheet guy, the business guy, the flow guy. And that appealed to me. So from a very zoomed out perspective, running a facility on my farm after seeing yours, I like the idea of that, if that was something that I was taking on. You know, what about you, Darby, seeing that from a zoomed out perspective? Yeah, I'm I'm the same way. I love logistics and planning. Um it's, you know, part of what made me a, a really good project engineer um, back in my engineering days. It's just kind of how I'm wired, how I think. And I, I'm right there with you. I would find that that part exciting. Um, but like I relayed to you in that conversation we had, Diego, I, you know, you've got you personally, like you have to be an expert on every single step in that process um, number one, so that you can teach the people who are coming in and number two, so that you can fill the hole if somebody doesn't show up. And this is something I've noticed with my red meat butcher here locally. Uh, sometimes I'll go down there and th this is not an enormous business, but it's not small. I mean, they, they are busy. They're booking out months in advance. Uh, they're doing what they can to, you know, increase how much, um, work they can flow through that facility and oftentimes I'll go down there and I'll see the owner, like he'll come out in an apron and, you know, he's, he's covered in blood. And, um, you know, he's like, yeah, well, you know, one of my guys was sick. Uh, he called in today. So I'm on the kill floor. Like the buck stops with me. It's my business. So I've got to jump in and do it at any time. Um, so there's, there's that aspect to it. But I think to your point, I mean, Ben's got a really great crew a really good group of people that they were having fun. They were jovial. Um, you didn't see anybody, you know, uh, slacking off. I mean, he even had uh, one or one or two guys in a one for sure. It was his first time there. And, you know, they were working their tails off. Um, but one of the reasons I think Ben has such good help, and I know he talks a lot about this in, in the processing course, is he pays them really well. And you get what you pay for. And uh, I found that fascinating. Um, 
uh, you know, like how well he paid because he he is rural. Like he is 35, 40 minutes north of the 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 northernmost point of Durham. Um, there aren't any jobs like really close by. Like you have to drive uh, to 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 go work. You know uh, what we'll call a a quote unquote regular job. Um, and I think paying really, really well out there, like that's going to attract really good talent. I don't know, Ben, can you kind of elaborate on that a little bit, how you kind of came up with your pay scale and talk about how well you pay your people? Yeah. So I think, you know, I've, I've, I'm always on the, the hunt for more workers and kind of whenever I meet somebody and I talk to them and say, Hey, you know, you should, are you interested in processing? And so it's kind of developing that culture. Well, one, getting the workers there and then developing the culture of the workplace is really important to me. Like, I want it to be fun and jovial, and but also people need to work hard. Um, and I do treat people really well. Um, so part of that is, is the pay. Um, I do pay people very well for urban work. And so we have people for rural work. And I have people coming from, you know, vast radius. Like, they're not local people who work for me. There is one guy like five minutes north of me who's another farmer. He comes. But most of the people are coming from Durham or Carborough. Um, there are a couple of people that come from like an hour and a half away. Um, so, you know, I people are coming from all over the place to work for me. Um, so one, it's, it's the environment that's there, you know, hardworking, um, fun, yoga atmosphere very productive where you're feeling like you are actually doing meaningful things. And then also the pay. Um, so I start people off at $10 an hour and after your fourth time out, it goes up to 1250. And so that, that kind of beginning stage of your fourth time out, if you make it four times, that shows to me that you're committed and that you want to come and that you're going to keep coming. Um, I don't want to invest my training time into somebody who's not going to be coming more than a couple times. And so that, that initial pay weeds a lot of people out. Um, and then once, you, once you're there four times, you know, then I'm going to start putting in more diverse roles, roles that take more training that aren't just you know, monotonous, um, easy movements. And then, I mean, most of the people now in my crew are getting $15 an hour. Um, so there's, there's a quick jump usually between 12, 15 and 15, just depending on how loyal you are and you know, how, how much I value, you, value your labor. Um, and I think that there is a feedback there between people's, how people value themselves and the money that they're paid. And if people are paid well, then they value themselves and then they value the work that they do. And so they're going to provide good work. And I think that if you paid someone poorly, let's say I just paid everyone at $10 an hour, then I don't think that there's that same feedback where people feel like they're, feel like they're valued. And so by paying well, it is a, um, it's a way to show people that I value them and thus they value the work. Yeah, I think your approach to labor is smart. It's interesting. You cover it a lot in the pasture and poultry processing course. And this idea of labor, this is one of those preconceived notions that I had going in. And I was listening to an audio book and the guy was talking about how a lot of times we'll make a negative perception of something never having done it. And we'll kind of perpetuate that belief within our head. We never haven't done it. We make this assumption. And if we don't want to do it, like that belief gets strengthened. Like it's something if you're really adverse to it, it's even more of a negative. And going in after, you know, I talked to John McCauley quite a few times on this. Like my worry was always like, where are you going to find these people who want to come out to process chickens for a day? But I don't really want to hire people like that's kind of like something within me, like the idea of hiring somebody is just not something that jives with me. And I say that as somebody running a business who 
probably needs to hire somebody. And then two, I've never done it. So this is me pulling this like big negative worry out of thin air based upon what I think and what I don't want to do. And what I'm by taking on that negative belief and this fear of hiring, you give up all the upside and the money that can be made from actually hiring somebody and running this business and from talking to you. Hiring hasn't been that much of a problem at all. It's like it's no hurdle. Like, do you even consider finding labor a challenge? Sometimes. You know, I, I think that I, I personally am constantly amazed that people still want to come out and work for me. Um, I, but it seems like every time that we process, there are at least enough people. Uh, but we've even had some processing days where I've had to say, sorry, man, like we already have a full crew. I can't accept anybody new. Uh, but it is always on my mind, how do I make sure that there are always enough people? Uh, because I think like you, like I realize that without labor, I can't run this business. I'm heavily dependent on labor. With the farm, I can just go out there and do it. It's, it's all on me. I don't have to rely on anybody else. Uh, but there is that factor of I have to rely on other people that they have to come. So it it is actually a factor for me that, um, you know, just making sure that there are enough people. And it, it, is, it is one of the major concerns that I have running this business is just getting people here. But that being said, I mean, you're always staffed. You're never coming up extremely short of labor. Like, how are you going about finding people to bring on? Yeah, so I, I have not, yeah, so I've never not had enough people. That is true. Um, so the way that I typically go out and look for people is, you know, one, I think I started off just doing a farming listserv. So if you're not familiar with a listserv, what it is is it's a group of people who are all part of the email group. And um, so you can all email each other or you can email the group through one email. So there are several farming listservs in this area for local farms. And so I, I do an email blast about once a year and just say, hey, I'm looking for labor. And then a lot of people join that way. Um, and then also word of mouth, you know, so someone starts coming and they say, hey, you know, um, so-and-so wants to come. Um, and so that's, that's another way is word of mouth. Also just my personal relationships. When I meet people, uh, if they seem like they might be interested in processing poultry, I'm going to ask them and invite them to come out. Um, and then sometimes, you know, I get calls out of the blue. People just, you know, say, hey, you know, I want to I want to come work for you. Um, or, you know, I want to come visit the farm. And then it turns out that they're farmers and then I invite them to join as well. So there, there are a lot of different ways. Um, but I'm, I'm, I guess I'm constantly searching in the back of my mind for people to fill the role. Um, because we have, I don't have the same group of people every single time um, because I'm not processing every day and so I can't offer people full-time work. So I'm processing anywhere between two and 10 times a month. And so people are taking time off of their work. You know, they're taking vacation time or they're just, you know, scheduling their work around processing days or they're, you know, they're scheduling on classes or putting their own farms on hold um, to come process. And so that doesn't, my times don't always fit their times. And so, you know, I have probably 20, 25 people who are, you know, regular employees, but on a given processing day, I might get between eight, five and eight. Um, and so there's kind of revolving, a revolving labor force. So you need a pool. You need time to build up a good pool of people and then you can dip into that pool and, you know, I have 25 people. I need to pull five today. And by the time that's good enough, you've done it long enough, you have enough there that you're covered most of the time for most of the jobs. Yep. Um, and I think that's another reason to pay people well is because they're going to keep coming back. Like they're going to take vacation time off of work. They're going to work their their own farm schedules around your schedule so that they can come. But if you don't pay them well, it might be the best time in the world, but they're not going to take vacation time off of work to come work for you. Around you, 
you got tobacco fields and gas stations. What's pay if you go up to a gas station and want to be a cashier at a gas station? Oh God, I can't. I can't imagine it's much more than minimum wage, which I think North Carolina is eight twenty five, maybe nine. Okay, so eight twenty five. So, so you're paying at twelve fifty if they come back four times. You're fifty percent over minimum wage. Yeah, but I, I also don't get local labor. And my labor is my labor is primarily coming from, um, you know, like what are my primary my primary labor force is actually like young people who are either beginning farmers or they're wannabe farmers. And so they're usually living in like an urban area like Durham, Carborough, Greensboro. Um, that, that's my primary labor force. And I think one of the assumptions I have is that it would have been the complete opposite. Um, <laughs> one of the girls who was there uh, working, uh, you know, the, the day that we were, uh, one of the days that we were doing filming, for this this course that we have coming out with you, um, she has like three times as much college as I do. Uh, she's got a bachelor's degree, she's got a master's degree, um, oh. and uh, but she's she's left all that to to go into farming. Um, and I was you have a very uh, unique group of people. And I, again, I think it was one of those assumptions and I'm like Diego. I mean, the labor is what scares me to death. And I hear you saying you're, you're worried about labor, but I think that's only from a, a, as a manager, you're, you're concerned about, Ugh, okay, am I going to have a full enough crew tomorrow to tackle the 225 birds I've got scheduled? But really what I'm hearing is that that's kind of misplaced. I mean, it's, it's a legitimate concern because you got to get the work done, but you've never not had enough. Like you've, you've always had enough people there. So I guess at least for you, and I think for, you know, a lot of other people out there, like you, you just, I, I'm always constantly amazed that, you know, I'll have people I know that will volunteer to come down and help me for a day. Like there's just something about getting out on a farm and working with your hands, getting dirty, you know, building up a good sweat, and feeling like you you did something amazing at the end of the day that tends to draw people into this. Yep, yeah, and I think that's that's the same, I think, effect that people have when they come process is that same connection that they did something meaningful with their hands. They did something productive that had an effect. You know, we transformed this live chicken into a piece of meat that's ready to go, you know, on the grocery store shelves, so to say. Right. Well, and it's kind of, there's some instant, there's some instant gratification there too, right? Because they see the job to completion. Like we started with 250 live birds and look at all these beautiful vacuum sealed, professionally labeled packages we made today. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And all those people, I mean, they were excited. They were proud. And they worked hard, like Darby said. And I think probably the biggest realization I had out of all of this was how valuable it was seeing the whole process. Like, I can't imagine if I had had to make an I'm going to process on farm decision without spending a day at your farm. Because I wouldn't have seen the labor, I wouldn't have seen the mess, I wouldn't have seen the kill station. It's so easy to get trapped up in this ideological bubble in the what if and look at catalog pages for where I'm going to buy my plucker and I put this plan together on paper. But it's the blood, it's the mess, it's the sweat, it's the hiring frustration that you're not going to find on the the poultry man product description page that I think is really going to make the decision of whether you want to do this or not. And I think that is the biggest thing that this course offers, not how to process a chicken, how to eviscerate it, which is covered in great detail. But I think if you're at all on the fence of like, do I want to process on farm or not? If you watch all this video, you'll very quickly know like, uh uh-uh, or yeah, I can do this because there's a lot that you are not thinking about, I guarantee it. Yeah, I I think you're spot on. 
the the actual you know evisceration killing the chicken that stuff's easy but all the background stuff and the management i think is, you're exactly right i think that's where the the money for this processing course really is valuable is you can find you know videos of people you know eviscerating chickens or how to the actual step-by-step processing on youtube they're free but i think that this stuff is really valuable because it puts it in a holistic context and you can see if it's really right for you or not and what it actually takes to process birds on scale. Yeah, and you're going to spend three to $10,000 in equipment, depending on if you get it new, or get it used. It's hard to move some of that stuff and sell it if you don't like it, probably at the cost that you bought it for. So getting consulting, taking a course, to find out if it's really a fit for you, I think can save you a ton of money. Um, you know, initially my worry was like, man, I don't want to kill chickens. Uh, I'm interested in eating chickens, but I don't really want to kill 250 chickens as in cutting the throat and seeing it, doing it while I was there. I think I've kind of gotten over that again. So it's just another preconceived notion I had that was based upon not doing it, not seeing it, that was solved by witnessing this. And if you think about this process, beyond the labor, Darby, which we've hit on, beyond the, what you mentioned earlier about how well Ben's paying his labor, was there any other big eye-openers for you? I couldn't believe how much ice he had in the back of his truck. It was absolutely insane. And uh, what Ben taught me was that it takes four to five pounds of ice per chicken um and of course this was in july when we were in north carolina uh to get the bird chilled down to you know 40 degrees before they package it and uh that was a big eye opener for me and just kind of one of those things that you you never um you know would have would have thought about um something else i wouldn't have thought about ben is a um a connoisseur of knives and sharpening knives at this point. And as we, we were talking, I mean, he's, he's told, he told me like how much money he wasted just, just on knives, uh, figuring out like, okay, well, this is a good knife, uh, for killing. This is a good knife for removing the feet. This is a good knife for removing the neck. This is a good knife for taking off the oil gland. And this is a good knife for cutting it up. The, the, the amount of money, you would spend and waste just on knives to, to even if you said, Hey, I'm a homesteader, I'm going to butcher 25 or 50 chickens. Um, you'll more than pay for the course. If you just buy the knives that Ben tells you to buy and the sharpening system that he tells you to buy, uh, even if you're only going to do 25 or 50 chickens, I, I think, you know, and that's kind of one of our tenants at grass fed life is bringing real value into anything we do and trying to set people up for success, uh, help them save money, help them make good decisions, help them walk through that holistic context. Um, and I feel really good, uh, you know, about having witnessed everything that, you know, we're going to be able to, to do that. And, um, I don't know, those were, those were a couple of the big eye openers for me. And then, then again, just that, like I said, it's, he's proving it out on paper that this is profitable. So, um, I guess one other thing I, I, I kind of wanted to mention, and I, I think the smaller your land base that you have to work with is, um, and the, maybe the smaller, uh, your option list is for butchering, uh, around your farm. Um, this is, this is pretty key for Ben. So Ben, you farm full time like myself you you derive your income from your farm you've got about correct me if i'm wrong 20 acres is that right yep that's right okay um which you can raise a lot of stuff on 20 acres but when we're talking about livestock um you know you can do some pigs you can do some sheep you can do a whole lot of poultry you can do a few cows but for you to be able to farm full time i mean if if i if i tell you tomorrow ben you you can't do poultry anymore I mean, it's from a livestock, it doesn't really work on 20 acres. Like it's really, really difficult. Yeah. So 
you, you know, you may find yourself in a, in a situation. I think this is where you find yourself. Like if I want to farm full time and I don't want to drive four hours each direction twice, um, this is something I'm going to have to do. And, you know, fortunately for you, North Carolina allows you to do that. I know that's something else you talk about in the course is kind of like the whole, uh, you know, how to approach, uh, you know, dig into and find out about state laws and how to work with inspectors and, and all those kinds of things. Um, but if you couldn't process on farm or if you had decided not to process on farm, I mean, you, you probably wouldn't be living your dream of, of farming full time, right? If I didn't do them on farm or take them four hours away, then I simply couldn't do poultry, and then I couldn't farm. Or at least, at least you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you'd have a hard time farming full time. I guess is my point. Yeah, yeah, no, I absolutely would. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to derive my full income from the farm if I didn't, if I did not want to take them to the processor four hours away, or I didn't process on farm. Then, uh, yeah, by process of elimination, I couldn't raise poultry. And then, yeah, I wouldn't be able to make enough money on my small land base for a full-time income. Right. Um, I'd still have, you know, a good chunk of my income from the pigs and the lamb. But, yeah, I mean, right now, poultry is a big part of my big part of my, my gross sales and my I'm dependent on it for income. So, yeah, I have to. This is, I guess, the decision or the place I'm in right now is either I process on farm and do my poultry on farm or take them to, you know, the processor or get another job to fill that income. Right. And I know that in talking with a lot of other farmers around the country, like you can find if it's got four legs, you can find a processor. I mean, yeah, maybe it's a little bit further away than you'd like to go, but usually within a couple of hours, like you can find a processor for just about anything. But poultry which is kind of the you know the 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 gateway drug uh for regenerative pasture based livestock farming because it is so easy to get into it's inexpensive um you know i started my farm with $600 right and now we're pushing $200,000 in sales 10 years later but i started with 600 bucks just doing poultry because that's what i could afford to start with i know that talking with a lot of people like there aren't any processors. And to that point, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm driving at is like, if you, if you don't have a, a processor nearby, and if you've got a smaller land base where you can't derive your entire income from lamb, pork, beef, what have you, like you, you may be left with, if you want to farm full time, like you may have to decide to, to process on farm and, uh, it's yeah. just, there's, there's, there's a lack of poultry, uh, processors out there. And I think that that's, you know, that's one thing a lot of people don't realize, uh, uh, until they, they kind of get down the road a little ways of like how difficult it is to find a processor or if they do find one, maybe how difficult it is to, to schedule dates. And I think Ben, you're in a unique situation given that you're in North Carolina, they have this exemption for this year that allows you to process birds for other farmers. That's some pretty nice optionality. If there's any other states that allow that, that is like a super bonus of processing on farm. Because I, I like I look at the processing business and what you do, and I know about the lack of poultry processors, and I'm kind of thinking like I would want to open a poultry processing business because there's no competition. The competition sounds like it's terrible. And you can make money doing it. And it doesn't require that much money to start relative to other businesses. And if you think about what you're doing on your farm, like your pastured poultry business of raising pastured poultry and selling it, that's only so scalable. And that's, I think, the problem with a lot of very small farms. Like you can't raise more meat or you can't sell more meat at a certain point because of either the market's too small or your land base is too small. But your processing business, as long as you're legally allowed to process other birds on farm, that is in theory infinitely scalable and could become a much larger business than the meat sales side of what you do. Absolutely. Um, I think that I was in a really lucky place, a really unique place. 
um, because I had I had my facility, I had all the equipment, and I had a team that was trained to process poultry. And what happened is last fall, about three weeks before Thanksgiving, the only inspected facility in the state shut down. And that left farmers, who you can imagine three weeks before Thanksgiving, had turkeys on the ground and had nowhere to process them. Uh, the plant in South Carolina was booked. They weren't taking any more reservations. The closest facilities, no kidding, were Ohio and Kansas. So the, the state poultry farmers were just left. They, they had no option. Um, and so the state uh, really kind of stepped up and they honored this, this section of the code which says that the director of the meat and poultry division of the Department of Agriculture can grant a temporary exemption for on-farm processors to process others' poultry. Um, and so that was kind of brought to her attention. She didn't even know it existed, that, that clause. And she immediately said yes and opened up the door for you know myself and others to process poultry. And... Um, and so, yeah, it, it was great because I had already invested in it and I knew how to do it. And so for me, it was a really easy business. And so right away, um, I opened up a you know, new LLC. And actually, the very first check I wrote for dependable poultry processors was to a lawyer for consulting on you know, how to make it legal and check liability. Um and yeah, it's been great because it has helped me to amortize the cost of the equipment that I have and to justify investing in equipment that I would not have invested in had I only been processing for my own farm. Because by scaling up the processing and doing way more birds for other people than I'm doing for myself, it you know justifies investing in large equipment, which costs a lot of money up front, but over time saves labor. But if I'm only processing, like I was for my farm, I was only processing four times a year. So, or five times a year, four, four chickens and one batch of turkeys. So it didn't make sense to invest in long-term labor-saving infrastructure when the long-term cost of that equipment doesn't, or the short-term short cost of that equipment does not um, outpace the long-term cost of the labor. Um, so it's, it's just been a really great boon for me in terms of, you know, uh, just more money and it's been easy because I already have the systems. And also because it's not, it's not state inspected and it's not USD inspected. It still falls under the poultry exemption, the on-farm processing exemption. So I haven't had to you know, do anything more with the state in terms of um, regulation, inspectors, that kind of thing. So it's really been a win-win all around for me. Do you think customers care that you process on farm? I think some people assume that it's adding value, but after talking to you, I don't know that that's true. What are your thoughts? I mean, there are some who do. And I think to those people, it's really important, you know, the, the animal welfare of, you know, that you're humanely handling the chicken. You know, it's a nice story. We did it on our farm, you know, manage every step of the process from the time it was a, you know, baby chick till it was in a bag. But I don't think that that's really that big of a sales point. I don't think that I would even, I don't think, I would sell any less chicken if I sent them to another processor. Maybe like, you know, maybe 10 chickens a year, um, just throwing that out there, based on that. Now, there is a factor, which is that I do a really spectacular job. Uh, my birds look great coming out of the process, coming out of my facility. Um, they've got they're vacuum sealed. I use a really thick uh, plastic, so it's a really nice feel, really good looking bird. 
have a professionally designed, colorful label that really jumps out at you. Um, I don't. I have very few broken seals because I use that thick plastic. Um, and there, there are other benefits to processing on farm. So I think that in terms of the quality of the final product, because it's such a superior job to any other processor out there, I think that gets me more sales than the story of you know processing on farm does. Yeah, I, I would I would add that I think like this isn't something you would go and do just so you could have the story. But for anybody out there listening, like if you are processing on farm because you need to, you want to, the context lines up, whatever, it's a great story to have. And I think it's something you should absolutely take advantage of. And I I think where this probably comes into play is like if it, you know, all things being equal, like, hey, your chicken's $4.99 a pound, uh, the guy that's you know ten ten vendor spaces away from you at the farmers market, his chicken's four ninety nine a pound. But you can weave into your sales story that like you did do everything from chick through processing, right? Like that, I I do think that people will resonate with that. That they'll they'll respect that, and I think it might help you maybe siphon some sales away from somebody else or like if it like that could be the the uh the one factor that causes them to buy from you versus somebody else yeah see i see a lot of the value is like down the line value that you can't quantify and purchase price things like i'm gonna cut up this bird versus i'm gonna keep it whole i'm gonna part them out this way where you can make decisions real time on the line that's huge. That's absolutely huge too. That's absolutely huge. Birds growing fast, birds growing slow. You you set your own processing date, right? You don't have to book months ahead because you, you're doing it. You just got to schedule the labor. You can use a thicker bag and that just enhances your long-term reputation. Like nobody's probably going to notice day of sale, but it shows a consistency of product over time. And I think those are those are hard to quantify benefits. You know, if I if I think about this, I think it comes down to what do you want to do? Like, does this even resonate with you? What do you have to do? And then if you're going to do it, you got to be prepared to write a big check to do this because you're going to spend a lot of money on equipment. You're going to need a structure and you better be prepared to work with labor and get dirty for one day. And while it's a lot of work, I don't think it's that much work. It's It's hard work for one day over nine weeks. I mean, that's not that big of a deal. I don't think that part of it. I think it's the money that's ultimately going to detour the most people because you got a lot of money and equipment. Yeah. And I think that that's one thing to really touch on. Like, so, you know, my cost, a big part of my cost um, is going to be that upfront infrastructure investment, like between my facility, the facility itself, and then all the equipment in the facility, I have about $25,000. Um, and I got lucky because I had a facility I could refurbish. If I had to build my facility with my, that concrete pad that my facility is on, 30 by 30 concrete pad, that the thickness of the pad, that alone would probably be $10,000. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you're going to have a lot of upfront infrastructure costs. And so I amortize that across the cost of my birds. But, you know, a big question is where are you going to get the money for your infrastructure? And you can shoe strings a lot. I bootstrap mighty hard my beginning years. Um, but if you're going to really go out and do it and do it well and, you know, do birds at scale, then you're going to need to invest in, in infrastructure and you have to figure out how you're going to cash flow that. Well, that's what somebody's really got to think about is if you're processing 250 of your birds and you're running four batches a year, that's a thousand birds and you're not allowed to process for anybody else, $25,000 to process a thousand birds four times a year, that payback period on that infrastructure is 
going to be a long time. Like you really got to think about that math and what your other options are because now far drive, like you can pay a lot of hotel rooms and a lot of gas for $25,000. But he didn't start there, Diego. Well, let's say it's 10 you're, you're, or five. You, that's still a lot of money that you really got to think about for just your birds. Right. Yep. But, uh, but you know, like, like any other business, you know, I mean, he started with uh, a lot less uh, money in the equipment and then he's, he's built it up over time. Um, I'm the same way that, you know, the first fencing project I did was, was $3,000 and I was fighting and kicking and screaming to come up with $3,000 to build some fence. And then the one I did last fall, less than a year ago is like $12,000, right? I mean, and, but that's, that's the difference between, you know, uh, 2012 and 2017, like our business had just, you know, grown that much. So, um, I think, and I think Ben too talks about in the course, like if you're just processing for yourself, like here's a, you know, here's a semi pro setup where it's, you know, in that, uh, you know, like if, if he had three to $5,000, like, he could he could get a lot of the equipment he would need to make it fairly efficient if he was going to process you know let's say he's doing 250 birds but he's going to do you know 50 a day uh for 5 days or he's going to you know do 75 a day for for 3 and a half days or whatever whatever it is versus the setup he's got now is like really a pro setup so that he can service somebody else very very well 250 birds in a day there's kind of a there's kind of a there's a baby step approach there, I guess, is what I'm getting at. There is, but it's just again, I just want to encourage people to like look at that baby step and say, How often are you processing birds? And can you justify that cash outlay? Because I mean the again, the advantage Ben has is he can process for other farms, which justifies him buying equipment to use on his birds as well. So it, there's a lot there, and I, I think the course helps distill this down for people to decide where do I want to go. And I, I go back to something I said earlier, like don't make a $5,000 mistake buying equipment that either isn't going to pay you back soon enough or that you hate using. I mean, what's the worst part of processing on farm for you, Ben? I'd have to say getting the labor. Um, it's not the process. Like I think the process is easy. I think that it's coordinating to make sure that there's always enough people. Uh, I think that's the most stressful part. Um, and I've got that streamlined pretty well, but it's still in the back of my mind. Like everything, the system is there, the equipment's there. I'm here. The other things I can't control. I think that's going to be the the hardest part. Say Darby came to you and he said, here's my situation. And he can insert his numbers here. And he said, Ben, I want to start processing on farm. What questions would you throw back at him to help him distill down if this is right for him? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I would ask him first, you know, what are your options for processing? You know, what are the third party options? And then I'd also want to know what did your state allow you to do? I'd want to know, you know, how, I want to know, you know, how hard are you willing to work? Um, you know, how determined are you to process on farm? And how much money do you have to invest in infrastructure? Um, I think that those questions are going to kind of steer the conversation to knowing whether or not on-farm processing is right for you. And if you're on the other side of that question, let's say this is real life and you wanted to do this now, what are the big things you'd be asking and trying to figure out going into this? Making sure that um, I was in line with what's allowed in my state um, and then trying to put together kind of a, a plan of a budget, if you will, of... Um, kind of like the the minimum base equipment that I would have to have to get through, you know, because we do batches of, you know, about 600 birds. And obviously, 
I wouldn't try to process all those in one day, particularly early on, but I would, I would probably try and figure out a setup of like, okay, well, what, what do I have to have so I can, you know, process 200 birds a day for three days or, or something like that. Um, and then trying to figure out like, you know, where am I going to get the money for this? Um, yeah, there's just, there's just so much, you know, we, we talk so much on this podcast about personal context and it, it sounds abstract and, you know, new agey and foo foo, but it really does boil down to like he said, how hard do you want to work? Is this the only way you can farm full time? Like, if this is what you want to do, then you you figure out a way to do it. And um, like you said, I you know don't dive into something and um, uh, you know spend five or ten thousand dollars on on something that's not going to do you any good a year or two down the line. And I, I see this all the time with particularly you know breeding livestock, where people will go out and buy some niche pig or specialty cow that they can't make good money with you can't unbuy things you can never sell them for what you paid for them and the you know the the kind of my one of my missions in life uh with teaching in this whole space is helping people avoid the big ticket financially speaking mistakes that will put you out of business before you're ever really even in business. Like you can, you can heal up from a, from a paper cut, but if you step on a landmine, you're done. Right. So, um, I think those are, those are the big takeaways for me is like, well, then how would I, you know, how would I put all this together? And, uh, maybe early on, I have to start with some of that, you know, that semi pro equipment. Maybe I can scrounge up a uh, facility. I mean, most of us on that, that have a farm, we've got an outbuilding we can look to use at least temporarily. Right. So maybe we can scrounge together three to $5,000, uh, to, to get some basic equipment kind of like Ben had, you know, going backwards a couple of years. And if it takes off and we get more efficient and we get our crew, you know, well then, then we can make the decision to, to scale up and, and get up to a point where we've invested $25,000. Um, but we, I think we've got some time to kind of figure that out. Like, do I really like this? Do I really want to keep doing this? Am I into it? Do I have consistent labor? Um, I, I guess the, uh, the big thing we're trying to illustrate here is like, this is completely possible. You just have to figure out if it's right for you and, and your farm and your situation or not. And Ben, hearing everything we've talked about, Seeing other people in the farming space, talking to the workers who come out and do this with you, where do you think people that have good intentions go wrong when making the decision to process on farm? I think if you approach it from an emotional perspective, you know, like I did when I started off, I was just going to do it because that's what Joel Salton did and Joel Salton, you know, is an idol. So I'm going to do what he did. Um, I think that's a big thing. Um, I think that another big one is trying to bootstrap it a little bit too much. Uh, you know, it's fine starting out, um, but you sooner or later, you've got to figure out how to get some good equipment in there. I think those are two main things um, that a lot of people do. Um, I think quality might be another one. I know that there's a, a on-farm processor near me um, that has, I'm not sure if they're still doing it, but for the longest time was, was uh, packaging in uh, Ziploc. And I just, I can't, um, I can't get behind that. I think you really got to do it quality. Like just because you're doing it on farm doesn't mean that gives you permission to do a uh, sloppy job. Right. And and to that point, like I, I can't even imagine trying to take that product and sell it a month later at the farmer's market. And just, I know you cover this in the course, Ben, but how much was your shrink wrap machine? I know your oh, vacuum seal. Yeah. I know your vacuum sealing now, but starting out, you had your shrink wrapper, which made some pretty nice looking packages, particularly on a whole chicken. 
How much did yeah. you have? How much was that machine? Um, I, I I'd have to go back and look, but I think it was like two hundred and fifty bucks, and then I spent another twenty bucks to get a, a separate thermostat because it, it was actually a scalder. Um, so let's say two seventy five. Um, total. So yeah, not much, but I mean, honestly, if you're starting off, you're probably using a turkey pot fryer um to scald that's how i started off too with a, a turkey pot fryer and a big pot of water and so you can actually you know clean that out after you're scalded and then fill it up with clean water and then you can use that same turkey pot fryer to shrink out your bag right but it's um, so i mean you don't, even you don't yeah have to it's a small amount of money yeah not much to to have a a a 20x uh, professional look factor involved. Yeah. And I, I'm right there with you on equipment. Like don't get stupid. Um, you know, don't, don't get stupid with, you know, sp- spending way more than you need to spend. I mean, I, 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 I've told this story before. I, I once, uh, on, on a consult, uh, talked to a guy out of buying a $30,000 diesel truck that he was convinced he needed uh, his wife was scared to death because the the old single cab V6 two wheel drive truck he had was just fine for where he was at at the moment. You know, like you can't be stupid by spending too much money. But I, I've done this too. Like I've been stupid by not spending money. Like not spending money can oftentimes cost you money. And thinking about having poultry with freezer burn on it in a Ziploc bag. A month later, and you're trying to sell that at the farmer's market, if you can't sell that product, well, how many of those does it take to, to, you know, pay for a whopping $275 shrink bag machine? I mean, it's just yep. not that much money. That's exactly where I was going. I mean, at some point, there's a cost to doing business, and there's certain equipment that is going to get you the the cheapest but best product. And I look at that like that's a minimum buy. And Ben's assemble kind of your basic starter equipment list, which is in the course. And it's like, if you don't have that much money, don't do this until you have that much money because you it you need to have the right stuff to some extent. And then there's better and better. If you think about what you've put together, Ben, and like the time that you spent with us, what is the goal or what do you want people to really get out of this course? I'd like people to to figure out if on-farm processing is right for their context. And if they do decide that it's right for their context, I don't want them to make the same mistakes that I did. Um, Darby brought up the the knives. I spent so much money on knives over the years just figuring out which knives actually work best in my context. And so, you know, if you don't have to go through that, spending $500 on knives, and you can just spend a hundred bucks and get the knives that you actually are going to use long term, and then the right sharpening set. It's going to save you money in the long term, as well as um, stress of making sure that your system is right. You will save more money by buying the course and going through it than the money that you would have spent on non-essential items, as well as items that were not right for the context. So ultimately, you're going to save money through the purchase of this course. And Darby, as somebody who's farmed for over 10 years, who raises pastured poultry, how do you see this course fitting into the pastured poultry landscape? I think it's something that's that's pretty needed, again, because I've talked with so many people who they're, they're really caught in no man's land because they don't have a processor they can go to. And I don't think they know what all is involved if if they were to process on farm. I mean, I think a great number of people who are listening to this, if they've raised pasture poultry like myself, like they have processed probably at least once with homesteadish level equipment. And, you know, processing poultry is really difficult work. I I think it's probably the, in my opinion, single hardest 
facet of any farm business if if you process on farm. Um, and, but I think more people would do it if they knew what equipment to buy, if they knew what kind of spreadsheets to put together, which we, we put in the course because we're all about spreadsheets and, and being legit and above board and showing that this cash flows. Um, and you know, if they, if they had, uh, a resource like this, and I think even if somebody buys this course and they spend the money on it, if they, through watching it, decide, you know what, this isn't for me. I'm not going to go into this. That was the best purchase you could have ever made because you have saved yourself, not just money on equipment, but you saved yourself so much time and energy and stress, right? And you can take that energy and that time and that capital and focus on something else. And I, I think that's one of the marks of, of any really good course, right? Um, is that it helps you decide whether or not something is for you. And if it is for you, it's going to pay for itself again and again and again and again through saving you a bunch of time and frustration and ultimately money from, from doing things wrong. That's one of the pieces of value that I see here. Somebody went up to me and said, I'm thinking about processing on farm. I would say, fine, watch this first. And then you watch it all, you decide it's right for you or it's not. And then for people that want to, I think after seeing it being there, I think it's easier than it would seem not having seen it. Like, I, I don't think it's that hard. I don't think it's that complex. There's a lot of work involved, but it's a process. There's steps. There's equipment made for all these steps. Anything you do is going to require exertion. And I think seeing the whole process, seeing the right equipment will make taking this on logical and methodical versus just freewheeling it and trying to take a bunch of YouTube videos and reading on bulletin boards of, well, I should do this or I should do that. For people that want to learn more about the course, you can go out to grassfedlife.co. And for people that have questions for you, Ben, or want to see what you're doing at Dawnbreaker Farms, where's the best place to get in touch with you, ask questions, and just get an inside look at what's happening out there in Hurdle Mills? There's the website, dawnbreakerfarms.com. Um, so those are social media as well, on Facebook and Instagram, Dawnbreaker Farms. Also, the processing business is Dependable Poultry Processors. And so you can find that uh, dependablepoultryprocessors.com as well as on Facebook and Instagram. A little side note, if you want to see a really good farm website, check out Ben's website, Dawnbreaker Farms. It's a, it's a really nice layout on your site. I actually use it as a reference in the course for a well-made farm site. So thanks for coming on and sharing today, Ben and Darby, and we'll see you next time. There you have it, Ben Grimes of Dependable Poultry Processors and Dawnbreaker Farms on on-farm processing. After hearing that, what do you think? Is on-farm processing right for you? If it is right for you, then I would strongly suggest checking out the new online processing course. Because I think the money that you'll spend on that course will save you a lot of mistakes and heartache later on down the line. Setting up your own on-farm poultry processing facility isn't going to be cheap and it's not going to be fast. There's a lot of effort that goes into it. This is one of those things you don't want to screw up. So do it right from the start. Learn from somebody who's made mistakes. Learn from somebody who's done it and learn from somebody who does this professionally for other farms. Check out the processing course at grassfedlife.co. And as a bonus to the first group of people into this course, you can view that course at a discounted rate because we're looking for people to go through this course and give us feedback on the course. In exchange for sharing your thoughts on the course, as a beta tester, you get to access the course for 99 bucks. 
That's the cheapest that this course will ever be. And that pricing is good until we fill up all the slots for beta testers. So it's first come, first serve. Once that group is full, it's full, and then the price goes up. You can view the course and sign up to be a beta tester at grassfedlife.co. That's all for this one. Thanks for listening. Until next time, be nice, be thankful, and do the work.